Well, it's in the name. We call it the divine liturgy or offering, the, you know, worship offering. And, and it truly comes because it comes from God. It really does. And that's, again, anyone who studies the divine liturgy um, with, with love and reverence, and St. Seraphim brings this out um, very substantially, that it, it is something that comes directly from, that's what makes Orthodox Christianity unique. I'm not trying to make up my own worship, and worship isn't ultimately based on my likes and dislikes, but I'm called to enter into something that transcends me, right? That I enter into something that is et eternal. And if we look, again, back to scriptural, you know, scriptural worship, when we look at the, the, the visions of heaven that we see in the scriptures, you know, in the Old Testament um, and in the New Testament, and we, we see reflected, we don't see rock bands, we don't see these things. And that's nice if you like music, fine. There's, there's a place for it, but not in the ultimate worship of God. And that's, that's the thing. There's, there's a setting apart. There's a setting apart as sacred, setting apart as holy, the worship that is dedicated strictly to God alone. And now, obviously, in the rest of my life, you know, you can, you can take up your guitar, you can sing some songs, fine. There's a place for that. I just don't bring that into the church. In the sense that when we look back to the scriptures, we look at the heavens, what are the angels doing? What are the 24 elders doing? They're singing hymns. Actually, they repeat hymns. Um, and then they're falling down, prostrate before the throne of God. They're showing reverence and awe. Holy, 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 Lord of Sabaoth. Heaven and earth is full of thy glory. And this is what we see the, the seraphim and the cherubim doing. When Moses went up on Mount Sinai, this is the things that the Christians were innately aware of. Of course, he imaged it in the Old Testament, so it wasn't the perfect image yet. But when he went up on Mount Sinai, God gave him a vision of heavenly worship. That's why in Exodus, and then it's repeated in Hebrews, the Lord commands him, make sure that you make everything according to that image, that type that you beheld on the mountain. Right? So it wasn't something Moses just made up. I think the children of Israel are really going to dig this. Because what happened was the children of Israel, we see this, this kind of... Um, you know, contrast, when Moses is in, on Mount Sinai receiving heavenly worship, the children of Israel are down in the plain. He's been gone a long time, gee whiz. Um, and, and then what do they do? They make up their own worship. They make up their own worship. Um, according to their own passions, according to their own things, and the, the golden calf and all of this happens. Um, so there is contrasted there a very important thing that we must follow heavenly worship and not, not kind of what we would find as the way we would like to worship, right? And so throughout the scriptures, again, throughout this, in the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation, really, if you're reading it, having been in the Orthodox liturgy, having lived in the worship of the Orthodox church, of the Christian church, really, that's what it is. This is just Christian worship. So that's simply what it is. But when you approach the book of Revelation, there's so much that you say, oh yeah, this, this is what we're doing in church. This is what we're doing in church. Um, why? Because it's not just a book of some, some cryptic book about the last, the last days, you know. I mean, it is the book of the last age, which um, St. John tells us. He says, you know, my brethren, we are in the last times. You know, that's St. John the theologian telling us, as, as soon as Christ ascended, we, lit, we entered into the last age of the earth. And, and how long that last age is going to last, God knows. And the book of Revelation is ultimately the book of the last age. Um, and of course, there'll be the last days of that last age, inevitably. But the important thing to understand when we approach it um, that the book of Revelation, one of the, the phenomenal things is that if you see after a lot of the cyclical um, happenings in the book of Revelation, they're all, the climax is worship in heaven. Climax is worship in heaven. 
And so what did the apostles do? What did, you know, they, they took this divine revelation that they had seen. Paul was taken up into the heavenlies, right? St. James, the brother of our Lord, St. John, the theologian, uh, of course, in continuity with that ancient Hebraic mosaic revelation of worship. And they, we put Christ on, in all of that, the fullness of all those things, and we have the divine revelation of Christian worship. Um, and so for us, that's, that's vital. That's, that's absolutely vital. Um, God help us. The thing is, is when we go to worship God, I'm, it's not, I'm not going to be entertained. I'm going to worship God. And in orthodoxy, we're not going to try to entertain you. That's not, that's not the point. The point is the transformation of the human heart. The point is that I could quiet my mind. In our times, we're so scattered. We're so fragmented. You know, we're really, okay, thank God here we are. Someone's watching this online. The internet, I guess, has a, a place right now. It's part of our world. Let's use it um, for, the good, you know, for the good, so to speak. Um, but in some sense, the, the negative effect is that we're just scrolling, we're just doing these things, and we get so fragmented. And, and that ability to collect ourselves as modern man is all the more difficult. Uh, and, but Orthodox worship calls us to collect myself, collect. And all of a sudden, when I'm quieting my heart, when I'm quiet, trying to quiet my heart, myself, and bring myself back together, all of a sudden, I notice all of the thoughts all of the, you know, the swirling of my own being. And then a lot of people flee. I don't want to do that. So I just, I'm seeking constant entertainment. Um, whereas orthodoxy is asking us, no, shh, quiet, quiet. Because unless you're quiet, you're going to miss that still small voice of the Lord speaking, right? And so you have to quiet your soul. Hezekiah, Hezekiah is at the heart of Christianity, right? And unless we're quieting ourselves. And in the Divine Liturgy, we're singing a lot of hymns, a lot of all based on Scripture, right? We're interceding for the whole world, but really at the heart of all of those hymns and all that motion is that Hezekiah. Uh, and so I think when a lot of people, that's why, again, Protestantism, you know, not to, I'm not trying to bash someone. It's not the point. It's compare and contrast. But really, if we look, the, the tragedy is, and we have to understand a little bit of history, nothing happens. Protestantism was the first one. The, before Protestantism, you never faced the people. The, the minister in orthodoxy, they're in the, facing the altar. We all face east together. We're all worshiping God together. That's the ancient tradition. Protestantism changed that. Now, it might seem small, but that's a fundamental change. Because when I'm, my back is to everyone in the congregation, except for when I'm proclaiming the gospel or giving a sermon or turning to give certain blessings. Otherwise, because then the message is, you know what, people? It's not about you. It's not about you. It's about all of us, right? Together, and the priest has been the one ordained, Priest, the priesthood is a sacrament. It's a mystery of the church. Um, he's the, you know, the, it's very deep. We won't get into the priesthood right now, I guess. <laughs> but he, for the good order, he's leading, as it were, the ship that he's been appointed over, right? As, the, as, as a shepherd of Christ. But it's not, a, we're all here to worship. We're all here to worship. Now, in Protestantism, they, they changed that. They, they changed the pulpit and everything's directed towards the people. Implicit in that is, this is about you more. And it becomes about, you know, teaching, which is teaching that has a place, but teaching isn't worship, right? And then it became about, especially in modern times, it really is very modern, all of the bands and all of the, I mean, even classic Protestantism. If you look at classic Protestant hymns, there's actually some very beautiful ones, very heartfelt, you know, searching for that that longing for Christ, and I think we can acknowledge that in a positive sense. And I think the tragedy of modern Protestantism is that it's completely even abandoned those things that it, it once at least still maintained. And now it's reduced to entertainment and, uh, you know, a, a, a teaching time. Which again, teaching, there's a point for that, but teaching is not worship. 
It's not worship. And in my mind is not the, you know, is important, but it's, it's also, again, the focus on teaching is, comes about because of Protestantisms being born out of rationalism. Really, it is. It's, it's in rationalism gave birth to emotionalism to try to balance those two things out. Whereas in orthodoxy, it becomes the connecting of the mind and the heart, right? And, and then when the mind is in the heart, we can function an Orthodox Christian, just Christian worship. That's the point. And then tragically, really tragically, the Roman Catholic Church, um, you know, again, using that, that word just generally, not, not specifically and theologically, um, turned to their altars in Vatican II, followed the Protestant model, followed the Protestant model. And now the only Christian, uh, you know, again, it's kind of just speaking generally, not, not specifically, like theologically, in that, in that very specific sense, the only Christian group that is, um, you know, maintains that ancient custom. And that's very important. It's very important. You know, reflecting back on my time in, in evangelical, charismatic Protestantism, one of the things, again, if there's, you know, uh, friends listening that are of that, of that um, kind of expression, then, then hear me out. Then, you know, really, if you look at it, the basis of it is your likes and dislikes. I realize when I'm going to church, I'm going there, I like what they're doing better. I don't like, and when you talk to people most of the time, that's what it was. Oh, I like this, I don't like that. I like their style of music better than their style of music, right? So all of a sudden, you have Christian worship based on me. That's not, that's not I'm not, it's not about me. It's not about me and my likes. I might like Johnny Cash. You might not like Johnny Cash. I might like Bob Dylan, and someone might think Bob Dylan is terrible. You know, that has nothing to do with. That's just likes and dislikes of humanity. But when it comes to worship, when it comes to worship, it has to be something that's challenging that very root of my ego. Right, which is the opposite of humility. Right? And so divine worship is calibrated to challenge that in us. And it's even more difficult, I think, for modern man, of which I'm part, of which I'm part. I'm not, I'm not excluded from that by any means. Um, and I think, though, ultimately, that's where transformation truly happens. Um, because when we... When it's based on likes and dislikes, it becomes, it becomes self-help with Jesus. And Christianity is not self-help with Jesus. It's not, it's not that. It's not motivational speaking, but with Jesus. It's not rock music with Jesus or rap music with Jesus or whatever it might be, country music with Jesus. All we do is we, we add a little Jesus to the end and, okay, Maybe there's, I need some motivational something or other. Fine. We're not saying that's necessary. But is that worship? That's where we're saying, no, it's not worship. It's not worship. It's just not. Um, because divine, when I approach God, when I approach God, I approach him. Christ says this. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. The divine liturgy is a revelation of Jesus Christ, indisputably so, indisputably practiced from the very ancient times of Christianity and preserved for us, those that want to take part in it, alive and continuous to this very day. And that's what we're called into. And then that way, when I come into Orthodox worship, I'm stepping upon the way of Christ, not the way I like it, not the way I like it, but the way that God has revealed it for me to worship and enter into, and in doing so, I find freedom. That's why Christ says, if you're going to be a Christian, take up your cross and follow after me. Right? Take up your, the cross is not pleasant. The cross challenges me. The cross, you know, makes me consider even certain of my own dispositions, certain of my likes and dislikes. 
It's supposed to be that. Christianity is challenging the problem, the problem generally speaking. I know it was interesting. I'll just note it was, it was um, you know, to Protestant folks out there, maybe they, someone sent it to me. I'm a little out of touch. But there was some huge men's conference, I guess, in uh, Missouri, Kansas City, I believe. Um, and I forget all the big, big hitter Protestant names. Mike Lindahl, I think, might have been one of them. But anyway, they opened up this program with some guy, you know, I mean, A, just look at it. Let's just look at it. This conference is just, it just uh, is a, uh, kind of an example. Big warehouse, behind all the speakers is this big graphic of a motorcycle. I mean, nothing to des- designate that it's Christian. And they open up with this very strange, and I agree, I mean, I've, I really have no, nothing invested in it because I'm not a Protestant anymore. But they open up with this, this crazy, pretty strong, obviously it was a pretty strong guy, but he gets up on stage, rips his shirt off, and they have a pole, and he's a sword swallower, and he climbs up this pole doing all these really strange kind of acrobatics. Then, of course, the, the big thing was is that one of the speakers was kind of disturbed, and, and maybe rightly so, maybe he was kind of good to start asking, is this really Christianity? Is this really what we're doing? Just entertainment now? This is, this is a men's com. Where's the challenge? You know, where's... Where is that in, in authentic Christianity will challenge you as a person, be you a man or a woman, right? But it will challenge you at every turn. That's the ascetic life. And because Protestantism is no longer ascetic at all, it's losing that complete challenge to my ego, which has to die on the cross with Christ so that I can live in his resurrection. But if there's no cross, if there's no asceticism, which is fundamental to Christianity, right? It was even somewhat understood by the early Protestant reformers and completely not lost now in modern Protestantism. In fact, we could say modern Protestantism is anti-ascetical, right? And they're groping, and that's, again, not to bash, but then they're groping for things um, because they've lost that substance. And Orthodox, the true Christian, come back, come back to true Christian worship. We invite everyone back to that. And, and it's always confronting the ego. Uh, and it's always a dying in Christ so that I might live in him. And not just nice words, not just something we're saying, but you, you, when you start encountering Christ in the divine liturgy, you know, then, then this, this thing becomes very tangible and very real. Um, so God help us. Again, all that to say, you know, they think if someone wants substance, but maybe some people don't want substance. I think maybe sometimes we want, we want to feel like we're worshiping God when, you know, God knows the heart of every person. I'm not trying to be a discerner of any one particular person's heart. But speaking sometimes as a system, maybe in reality, all we're doing is putting up golden calves and worshiping them instead of waiting for Moses to come to us with the true revelation of God.